Great. How are you doing this morning? That was not very excited. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Packers already won. Badgers already won. If you care, the Cubs are going to the World Series. So we have no sports anxiety this morning. That's good. Everybody has already won. We don't need to be worrying today. Uh, if you're like me, I always have that in the back of my head. I like, I like the Packers. Good. So, uh, again, maybe not everybody knows me. My name is Andy. Uh, I'm just a member of Community Church, and every once in a great while, Pastor Chris and the elders let me stand up here and speak. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity again. So if you hate what you hear this morning, come back next week because Pastor Chris will be preaching next week. And uh, last week, just if, if you can remember back with me to last week, we had Mission Sunday, which was awesome. Was it not? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I, I think Community Church, one of the reasons that I started attending Community Church 10 years ago was because we were a church that cared about missions, and even more than that, a church full of missionaries. Not just vocational missionaries, but missionaries who go to work Monday through Friday at the paper mill. They go to work building houses, and they live their lives at their jobs proclaiming Christ. You are all missionaries, and Community Church cares about that part of your life. I love that. So last week, Pastor Chris mentioned to us again that uh, we are all tied to missions, and we can't help it. Because each one of us, if we are in Christ, is a product of missions because a missionary was sent to us, and we are missionaries. God calls us all to be on mission with him. Nobody gets out of that. Everybody has a role to play. So we are all tied to missions. So last week, uh, I mentioned that because we took a little bit of a break from the book of John. We've been plodding through the gospel account of John for, how long has it been now? Three years. <laughs> Three years. I want to say maybe nine months or something. Uh, it seems to me like it's, it's gone really fast because I've been having fun, but for some of you, maybe it feels like three years. So we, uh, we're going to get back uh, to John this morning. So if you can remember with me back even further to two weeks ago, this is, this is a long ways away, but two weeks ago, Michael Hughes stood up here and did an excellent job of showing us plainly out of the end of chapter 10 in John, Jesus' credentials. Jesus is proclaiming clearly who he is and why he came to earth at the end of chapter 10. Uh, he is the Messiah, and he is God. And again, we remember that this is one of the hallmarks of the Gospel of John. John comes out with guns blazing. He makes no equivocation about who Jesus is. He tells us very plainly over and over from the beginning that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is God. Every single story in the book of John points to that fact. And that's a little different than the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In those other gospels, we kind of have, as we read them, a revealing of who Jesus is as we go through the gospels, but not in John. In John, we get the whole picture right away, John chapter 1, and then we get the whole picture in every chapter of John thereafter. So, the point of the gospel account of John can be summed up by one statement that is repeated over and over again in the gospel. And the statement is, so that you will believe in Jesus. The whole point of the gospel of John is so that you will believe in Jesus. So that was what was happening at the end of chapter 10, two weeks ago. And basically that's going to be what is going on at the beginning of chapter 11 as we dig into that today. So this morning, uh, we're going to start in John 11, and I'm going to go through the first 16 verses of John 11. And it's a story uh, of the death of Jesus' friend, Lazarus. And this is likely a familiar story to many of us, but try, if you can, 
not to be thinking too far ahead in the story as we go through it today, because we're only going to get through about a third of it. And we're actually going to end up in kind of a depressing spot uh, at one third of the way through the story. So try, if you can, not to be thinking too far ahead as we go through it. Uh, So to help us feel some of the tension in this passage, I'm actually going to read another story in the Gospels first, and then we'll come back and read the beginning of John 11. Uh, You can turn with me if you want, or just listen along. I'm going to read out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Um, The the beginning of chapter 7, starting in verse 2. And I'm going to skip around a tiny bit. Uh, This is a a similar situation that Jesus is in to what we're going to be looking at today. But Jesus' response is very different. So I want to kind of set the stage with Luke 7, and then I'll go right into John 11. So Luke 7, starting in verse 2. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And he was not far from the house, but the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, But say the word, and let my servant be healed. And skip to verse 10. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. All right, turn to John 11. The passage we're going to camp out on today, verses 1 through 16. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. All right. So that's where we're going to end today. Kind of depressing. (laughs) But there's hope, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So there's a huge difference between what Jesus did for the centurion servant and what Jesus did or didn't do for Lazarus at this point. And I think uh, as we go on in John 11, depending on how far we get next week, you're going to see that the reactions are appropriate uh, from Mary and Martha. They are not very happy with Jesus at this point. And the disciples are confused, and it looks like Things just aren't working out the way they're supposed to work out. I think we have all in our lives had some experience of bitterness and sorrow. Some of you more than others. uh, I'm sure that later on in my life, I'm going to have more experiences with bitterness and sorrow. 
And we wish that Jesus would just take that experience away from us, that he would just get rid of it for us. There are times in our lives where we all wonder where God is, and we wonder why he isn't showing up for us. And that's exactly the situation that we find Mary and Martha and Lazarus in in this passage. Where is Jesus? The two sisters, Mary and Martha, knew the power of Jesus to heal. So they send word to Jesus in verse 3. They just say, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And I think it's interesting and telling that the sister's statement to Jesus doesn't even contain a request for Jesus to come. They're not pleading with Jesus saying, Lazarus is sick, he's going to die, you need to come and heal him. You need to come and make him better. Can you please come? It doesn't even contain a request to come because they didn't need to ask Jesus to come. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus and loved them. And it would be impossible for Jesus to abandon his friend in his friend's hour of greatest need. They knew Jesus had healed people like the centurion's daughter without even showing up on the scene. He has that power, and they are sure that Jesus cares about them. But the craziest thing happens when Jesus gets this message. And I want to read again verses 5 and 6. This is almost insane. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he did what? He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He loved them, so he didn't go to them. What? That doesn't make sense. And we're, at, we're left, as we read this passage, we're left to ask the question, how in the world is that love? That doesn't sound like love to me. Verses 5 and 6 should read something like, Now, when Jesus heard that Lazarus is ill, he dropped everything he was doing and immediately went to Judea and healed Lazarus, and everybody was happy. That's how we think it should read, but it doesn't. Instead, we have Jesus waiting for two days, and then he starts to get around to going to see Lazarus. And I want to read verse 7 and verse 8 again out of chapter 11. Then after this, after he stayed for a couple of days, he says to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? So I think that's interesting. Uh, The disciples here figure they know exactly why Jesus is not going to Lazarus. Jesus has a really good reason to not go to Judea. That's because if he goes there, he's probably going to be killed, likely. Or at least somebody's going to try to kill him. So the disciples think they have it figured out. When Jesus gets word that his friend is sick and on his deathbed, Jesus doesn't go. And the disciples naturally make the conclusion that the reason Jesus isn't going is because he's afraid for his life. He knows if he does go, he's going to be killed. So when Jesus does get around to saying, you know what, disciples, let's go to Judea. The disciples are like, what? We thought we we knew why you weren't going, but now you are going. And it seems like it's a little late. Like if you were going to go, why didn't you go two days ago and not now? So the disciples, I think, are a little bit confused. They think Jesus is hanging back because the Jews want to see him dead. But now Jesus does decide to go. And Jesus' answer back to the disciples, it's a little confusing, uh, but I'll read it again. Jesus says to them, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. So that's a... That's a weird couple of verses. For the sake of time, uh, I'm just going to say that Jesus is basically saying with those two verses that God is calling him at this point to go to Judea and heal Lazarus. 
but he wasn't calling him to go two days ago. So Jesus is just saying, I have work to do, and God is telling me that right now is the time. The time wasn't two days ago, but it's now. That's what those mean. And Jesus knows at this point that Lazarus is dead. And he says so much in verse 14. Uh, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. So Jesus knows that the time for healing Lazarus from being sick, anyway, has passed. But now he's deciding to go, or now he's saying that God is calling him to go to Judea. And I can imagine the disciples thinking, what? You could have healed him, Jesus. You could have, two days ago, but you decided not to. And now that it's too late to heal him, you're telling us that you're going to go walk right into a situation that could likely end up with you being dead. This doesn't make any sense. What are you thinking, Jesus? That's my conclusion when I first skimmed this. What are you thinking, Jesus? And just a side note, uh, if you think it's inappropriate <laughs> to question Jesus' actions as you read scripture like that, uh, I understand, but I want to encourage you because particularly in the book of John, it's when we ask those kinds of questions about Jesus' actions, like, what were you thinking? That we start to uncover some of the real truth in the Gospels. So I want to give you permission as you read through the book of John, as you read scripture, to ask those difficult questions, like, how does this make sense? What were you thinking? This doesn't look like you love them. Go ahead and ask those questions, and don't feel bad about it. Because when you press into those, that's when you start uncovering a lot of the truth in the text. So, uh, as far as the disciples, the dying Lazarus, and Mary and Martha know at this point in our text, Jesus doesn't show up. Everything looks like defeat. They told Jesus the situation. There was an expectation that Jesus was going to come and make everything all right. But as far as we know right now, Jesus decides not to do that. The great physician has decided not to heal. The great rescuer has decided not to come to the rescue. And we'll see perhaps next week, uh, depending on how far Pastor Chris wants to go in John 11, that Mary is pretty upset that Jesus doesn't come to the rescue, that Jesus doesn't come and heal. It even says in the text, she gets up quickly and goes straight to Jesus and says one thing. If you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And I don't want to make too many assumptions about how exactly she said it. But you have to imagine there's a little bit of bitterness. If you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. You failed. How come you didn't do this? That's where we're at right now in John 11. And to top it all off, look at how the passage we're looking at this morning ends in verse 16. <laughs> so Thomas called, called the twins, said to his di fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Disciples are sure Jesus is going to be killed. And Thomas says, all right, this is it. Let's go too, that we may die with him. And it's just, this is a show of extreme loyalty. It's not Thomas saying, I give up. This is worthless. He's, he's showing that he's extremely loyal. But that statement doesn't inspire a lot of hope, does it? No. All right. Let's go too that we may die with him, because he's going to get killed. So we're left in this pretty hopeless situation in John eleven sixteen, 16. And we're asking ourselves, what exactly is Jesus doing here? What is he doing? And I think we definitely get two hints in our passage as to what Jesus is up to. And those come in two verses that I kind of skipped over so far, verses 4 and verses 15, and I want to read those again. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, 
so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then verse 15. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. And I'll end there. So God is doing something way bigger than we know. He's just doing it behind the scenes. God has bigger plans, which is great. And it helps us to at least wonder what's going to happen next. We're waiting for something big to happen. We just don't know what it is. But I, I still have at least one un- unanswered question in our text. I'm still not getting how verse 5 fits in with everything else that's going on. Verse 5, again, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And verse 6, So when he heard this, he stayed two days longer. I still don't understand verse 5. He loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. But it doesn't look like love. How is that love? And, and as I studied this passage and thought about it and prayed about it, uh, I'm just going to offer to you the only thing that I could come up with for how this could be love. And I think it helps tie some stuff together. The only way I can answer the question of how this is love is if I define love as giving us what we need most. Love is giving us what we need most. If I love my kids, I will always try to give them what they need the most. It won't always be what they want the most. Uh, And lately, with one of my kids, it seems like it's never what they want the most. (laughs) But true love is giving what is most needed by a person at any time. So, I would submit to you that As far as we know in John 11, what is most needed in this situation right now is verse 4. What is most needed by Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and probably the disciples as well, and probably everybody else who's going to watch what happens next, is a revealing of God's glory and power. That's verse 4. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So, for Jesus to love Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he is going to give them the best picture of what they need the most, and that is a revelation of his glory and power and love. And that's coming next week. Verses 14 and 15, uh, again, are kind of the whole point of John. I'll just read verse 15 again. For your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. We've got that phrase again. It shows up again and again and again in John. So Jesus is giving people, is about to give people a great picture of his glory. And the purpose of him doing that is so that you would believe. And Jesus is going to say that again next week, I think. And he's going to say it again the week after that. I'm doing this so that you know who I am and so that you will believe in me. And Jesus is saying, I'm doing this, I think, I'm doing this so that you would believe even when things look like they're not working out. I'm going to do this so that you'll believe even when it looks like I didn't show up. Even when it looks like I failed. I'm going to do something that's going to make you believe even in those circumstances. And I think just, just in my, I've been trying to read the Gospel of John uh, every week as we go through our sermon series. And I haven't made it every week, but uh, most weeks, and it's been really good. And I think Uh, one of the things that I'm starting to see over and over again is that Jesus is putting, uh, he's, he's putting himself in situations in the book of John that portray who he is and what he does in situ, in circumstances that are, uh, crazy. 
So what I take that to mean is John, who's writing this gospel account, is trying to get us to believe in Jesus, to trust Jesus, even when situations don't look the way we think they should. And that's particularly true in John 11. Jesus hasn't showed up. A request was made. He didn't come. Lazarus died. And now he's going probably into a trap set for him by people who want to kill him. But he's going to do something that will make you believe, even in situations that look grim in your life. Even when things aren't going well for you or for me at work. When a loved one is sick or passes away, or when you're sick yourself, or when something worse than that comes up in your life. This account of the death of Lazarus is written so that we will believe and trust Jesus even when things don't look good for us. And even when things are going well. I know for myself, uh, oftentimes, the times I struggle uh, with remembering God's grace and remembering God's glory are usually actually not times when I'm doing poorly or going through a crisis. They're times when I feel like I'm doing pretty well. That's when I tend to forget about God's love and God's grace and God's power. Maybe I think that I can get on without the Lord when I'm doing fine on my own, or I just simply forget how desperately I need the grace of Jesus every day in my life. What I need most when I'm in those situations is the same thing that I need when I'm in situations when I'm just overcome with sorrow or pain. It's a revelation of the glory and power of God. So I was thinking back uh, this week as I prepared, and I was reminded of a sermon by Mark Bonk from a couple years ago now, uh, but something he said really stuck with me all this time. And I don't remember what scripture Mark was bringing to us. I'll have to go look it up. But I remember that he said this. He said, when we make decisions regarding how we should think about God or how we should act in response to God, our main concern should be what gives God the most glory. So when we make decisions about how to think about God or how to act in response to him, what we should be thinking about is how can we give God the most glory. And I loved that truth. And I think that's exactly the same thing that Jesus has in mind in John 11. In this situation, Jesus is making decisions based on what he can do to bring God the most glory. Because he loves Lazarus and he loves Mary and Martha, he is going to do the thing that brings God and himself, since he is God, the, the most glory. And he's doing it because that is exactly the thing that is best for the people who he loves. And you can read ahead in the story this week if you want. In fact, I would... I would encourage you to do it and see how the story ends. Is that okay? They're not going to ruin your sermon next week by doing that, are they? Okay, good. So feel free. Uh, watch the rest of the movie and see how it turns out. <laughs> see how Jesus turns this sorrowful situation into the most loving response imaginable. But for us this week, we can take some encouragement when we are wondering where God is in our lives or wondering why God hasn't seemed to show up in our situations. Jesus loves you just like he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Promise. He loves you. And somehow, some way, Jesus is giving you what is ultimately best for you in your situation even if it's really difficult to see how that is working out in your life. So I know this isn't exactly uh, encouraging to some of you in the moment when you're dealing with sorrow, when you're dealing with pain, to just say, you know what, Jesus is just giving you what's best for you. 
That's not really encouraging. <laughs> I understand that. But I don't know what else to say because I, also, because I know that it's true. I know that it's true. Sometimes it takes years. It takes a lifetime to be able to look back and see what God was doing in you and through you while you were going through difficult times. God gives us victory over our struggles, but oftentimes growth looks like death. And that's a difficult truth. Lazarus has died, and things look grim. But we have a perfect, ultimate example of this kind of love. As we will see in weeks to come again, Jesus is doing something far greater than anyone could have possibly imagined, using death to show something greater than death itself. And Jesus shows that same kind of love, ultimately, in the way he gave his life for us. The disciples, at the end of the book of John, are going to be in a similar situation to where Mary and Martha are in John 11. The disciples are going to be wondering, how could this happen? Jesus has been killed. Is it over? What do we do now? It looked like things had failed at the end of Jesus' life. But then, there was an empty grave, there was a risen Savior, and there's a king reigning in heaven to this day because of Jesus' physical death. And because God did something so much greater than we could have ever imagined. So Jesus is doing something wonderful with Lazarus. And at this point, we don't know what it is, but we'll get there. And Jesus is doing something far more wonderful than we could have imagined with his own death and resurrection. And I promise you um, that he's doing the same in your life. He's doing something far more wonderful than you can even imagine, no matter what you're going through and no matter how difficult things get. When it seems like it's too late and that Jesus hasn't showed up, take heart because he does have something more wonderful for you, no matter how difficult that is to believe in the moment. He loves you and he will do what is ultimately best for you when all is said and done. That is what we see starting to happen in John 11. So tune in next week for the next installment of the story. But will you pray with me now? Uh, and then we'll have the worship team come back up. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths in it. Uh, and God, I thank you um, as hard as it is to, to thank you for these times, I thank you for the times when we are drowning in sorrow. I thank you for the times when things aren't going the way we expected them to go. Because those are the times when you show yourself to be more powerful than we could have ever asked or imagined. And I, I want to pray, God, for those of us in our room who are going through difficult times and for those of, of us in the room who or maybe going through a great time and are potentially forgetting about how much we need you. God, will you show us this week, give us a glimpse, just a little glimpse of what you might be doing in our lives as we wait for the revelation of your glory, God, because you love us. Give us perseverance, give us hope, give us joy in the midst of everything that life throws at us. Would you do that for us this week? We pray in your name. Amen. Stand with us, please.